All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our botanical briefing, Punk Rocks the Garden. My name is Kelsey Childs. I'm the Registrar and Manager for Museum Exhibitions here at Selby Gardens. And I'm joined today by Nathan Berneman, our Manager of Horticultural Exhibitions. Nathan, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself, your background and your history here at Selby Gardens? Absolutely, thank you, Kelsey. Uh, so as Kelsey said, I'm the Manager of Horticultural Exhibitions. And so what that means is I'm in charge of uh, conceptualizing the designs for our exhibitions that we have three times a year. And then every little detail and step from design to installing those exhibitions I'm involved in. I've been at Selby uh, coming up on three years now, and I've been in this role just about a year. Uh, before I was in this role, I was with our horticulture team in the gardens helping take care of our collections in the gardens and, um, and really cutting my teeth on horticulture there. Uh, outside of that, I have some experience uh, with biological education, as well as some background in music. And also I have some sculpture and fabrication experience as well. That's really helped me kind of, you know, wear all the hats of this role. It definitely sounds like you have all the skills needed for the position. So you're a great fit and really fun to work with. Um, for this presentation, everyone, we'll be monitoring the chat uh, throughout the discussion. So feel free to answer your question or to enter your questions into the chat. We'll do our best to answer them as we're discussing the presentation that you'll be seeing. If we're not able to get to anything, um, we'll be entering our email addresses in the chat so you can send us messages after and we'll respond as we can. Um, to begin, let's share an overview of the process. So Nathan, what does that process look like of beginning from step one to the last step of opening the exhibition? Right, Kelsey. Well, you made this awesome infographic which lays it all out um, and sort of distills it and we'll go over all of these, but uh, you know, I wanna say it's certainly not as tidy as any chart can capture. Uh, this is all linear and goes from one step to the next, but really the process is messy and organic and uh, things overlap. We have to you know, adjust, change. So really if we wanted to put arrows between all these steps, it would look like a spider web or maybe a, a scribble. I don't know <laughs> if you'll be able to see any of the words. Um, but you know, it starts with uh, working with your team and working with uh, the CEO, Jennifer Omanecki and CEO of Wendy Demings, as well as the rest of my team, the horticulture team. And, um, you know, it really starts with conversations, brainstorming, we work our way through to idea generation, we start to visualize what ideas look like, share those ideas with the rest of the team, get feedback, and then we start to um, plan, source, acquire goods and materials and plants, and then get all the details together and put a show in. And we'll sort of go through each of these steps in a little more detail. Yes, this was definitely an oversimplification of what the process looks like, but I wanted to make sure it was legible, at least for people. So to start, how do we begin this large daunting project? Right, so uh, at the beginning, it involves a lot of collaboration and research um, and really getting together with different parts of the organization, different departments and having conversations on what themes of the artists do we want to show for this exhibition. Um, and as well, what makes that artist and these particular works different from any other artists out there. Um, so it's a lot of meetings, a lot of taking notes on meetings so we can remember what we're talking about and key in on details that we decide might be relevant to displays we can actually achieve in the gardens. Um, so there's different conversations with different people and from those different conversations we're able to uh, get niche sort of ideas, you know, so we'll have broader picture discussions uh, in between departments of the organization, like with yourself and Dr. David Berry. Um, then we'll have more detailed conversations, like perhaps with myself and Christopher Ellen Star of the Gardens, or myself and Angelata in the uh, greenhouse, to sort of key in on more detailed things. Uh, but what we're looking at here are just sort of some excerpts from various meetings. On the right side here, it's just sort of a list of meetings that will date um, 
And so there's a lot that goes into it early on just to learn, you know, who we're working with and why we're doing what we're going to do before yeah. we get into the how and the what. Exactly. So after all these conversations and the research that goes into it, how do you translate the information that you learn into concepts? Right. Well, a lot of it is uh, pen and paper. So earlier on during these conversations, um, we're really just sort of trying to generate as many ideas as we can uh, so that we have a large pool of ideas to draw from. And often the quickest and easiest way to do that often but not always, is to uh, do a sketch on pen and paper as old school as it is. Uh, so what you're looking at here is a collection of sketches from the horticulture team that were really early on in the design process for this Maplethorpe uh, Smith exhibition. And you know, we do different types of sketches. Some are more overviews of an entire area or vignette. Sometimes we'll key in on a detail for how we can use a certain material or plant in a specific way. So maybe just a, an element of the vignette. And then sometimes we'll do more like an overhead view of a layout, you know, kind of think about how it'll fit in the space from a bird's eye view and how people will interact with it as they walk through it and around it. And oftentimes with our sketches, we'll have little um, bits of text that sort of explain what we're looking at one for us to remember, you know, if there's a little detail that'll help us fabricate it. And two, just to help us explain it to each other, because, you know, really that's what these sketches are for, are for us to visualize it ourselves and then communicate with our team and the other teams in the education department and elsewhere about what these ideas are looking like. Right. So we start with pen and paper, and then do you work with more advanced technology to kind of formalize the sketches that we are interested in moving forward? Absolutely. Yeah. And um, we work with uh, different digital tools, such as Photoshop type tools and 3D modeling tools like SketchUp. Uh, these really help us get a more detailed and uh, specific uh, realistic renderings of what we're going to get, as well as, you know, sort of help us think about how we're going to build things as we're doing this sort of design process. Uh, there's sort of a couple, you know, ways we use SketchUp. One is more for this aspect, which is like uh, just to be able to visualize what things are going to look like. You know, I'm a little more loose with how I place things, but it allows us to create a rendering for ourselves and to share with the uh, your team and uh, Jennifer Amanecki and Wendy Demings and my team as well. Uh, but then once we get further in the process, SketchUp is a really powerful tool that allows us to think about how we're going to build things and get specific measurements that our facilities team can cut or our fabricators can cut, as well as we can predict, you know, how many sheets of plywood we're going to need, how many square feet of mulch or gravel we're going to need, how much paint we're going to need. And you know all the sort of details like that. These three D modeling tools are extremely helpful for us to to get. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was really um, like inspired to see you use this tool for the design of the outdoor exhibitions, and was grateful that you spent some time going over SketchUp with me. So it's definitely something I'm working on um, getting more familiar with to help with our museum exhibitions as well. Um, so we've talked a lot about the sketches and the concepts of what you're building. You're in the horticulture department. So when and how do the plants come into play? <laughs> right, of course. Yeah, it's not all, uh, not all pen and paper and pixels on a screen. We do actually have living plants, which, which is what makes us a living museum. Yeah. Uh, so of course, as horticulturists, myself and the rest of the team, you know, we have a, a palette of plants in our mind and we're kind of riffing off each other of what might work, one, to execute the theme, but two, to, uh, you know, actually fit in the site or for the specific application. Um, so we'll, we'll imagine, you know, for this show, we wanted a bunch of color for Patty Smith and a bunch of gray and dark grayscale plants to represent Robert Maplethorpe. Uh, however, you know, we can't just manifest plants out of thin air, we do have to work with what's available to us. And for these shows, we do work with nurseries uh, and wholesale nurseries in the state and in the local area. 
to acquire things. So there are some field trips that are involved to scout what material is available for us. A lot of phone calls and conversations and looking up online to see what people have available. But uh, really it's one of the funner parts of the job is to go visit these nurseries because oftentimes that is the best way to see what people have. And uh, if you can ask uh, the owners of the nursery or the employees, they're often very knowledgeable about what they might have that can fit uh, the parameters that you have. Of course, while we're doing this, we're keeping track of everything, you know, how much we're going to want to buy, quantities, who from, and then we can put together orders from these nurseries. What was your favorite plant that you incorporated into the exhibition? Great question. It's actually pictured here on the top right. It's in our Selby work van. Uh, its common name is blue tassel fern. <laughs> Uh, however, this one specifically is Phlegmariaris dalhousianus. Um, it's an amazing epiphytic or lithophytic fern ally or lycopode. Um, and it just has this fantastic bluish gray foliage on its fronds that hang down. Um, this particular one is very hard to cultivate, very hard to propagate, hard to come by. I think it's native to Australia and that region in the South Pacific. And it's just an amazing plant and it worked perfectly for our exhibition. Uh, and that was a great acquisition because while well, we did use it for the exhibition, this is a plant that will stay in the collections. Uh, whereas a lot of our plants that we acquire for the exhibition, so we will end up uh, getting rid of through sales to staff, uh, giveaway to staff or sales to our members. Awesome. Um, so when we were talking about the development of the concepts, you mentioned the phrase, <clears throat> excuse me, ground truth. Can you explain a little bit about what that is? Absolutely. So we, uh, we come up with all these ideas, the pen and paper, and as powerful as our 3D design tools are, um, really seeing things in the space is vastly important to getting a good product in the end. And fortunately, we are able to a large degree to kind of try to prototype things as best we can, um, working, you know, around our other shows and exhibitions and around the gardens. Uh, so one good example of this that I think illustrates it very nicely is well, there were a few vignettes where we wanted to have uh, sort of gray walls with descending gray colors that create a gray gradient. Um, and, you know, it's all well and good for that to be a bunch of bucket tool paint in the software, but uh, really to see it in sight is a whole nother thing. Um, and not only was it like, you know, we could get paint swatches from a paint manufacturer, but you can look at that under fluorescent lighting and then you go out and look at it in the gardens or in the greenhouse and it might look absolutely different. So um, yeah, we actually had to take the paint swatches out to the site. And we, not only did we do that, but we ordered samples of the paint, painted up some sample boards and then brought those into the site. And, uh, you know, we were surprised on what shades we actually ended up using for the show because of the sort of warm environment in which the paints are on display. You know, the, the types of gray that we ended up getting were different than what we would have got if we looked at it in fluorescent light or if we just went off of a software or a picture online. So yeah. it's really important for us to do these sort of prototypes and experiments throughout the process, both early on and as we're uh, getting further along too. Yeah, I th thanks for sharing that insight. I think it's um, an important universal step in kind of any planning process and doing it consciously um, is something that I think everyone can kind of incorporate into anything they're planning for. And, you know, we do something similar with the paint swatches here in the museum. We order um, different samples and paint a large uh, sample board and then bring it into the gallery space to make sure it makes sense for the space we're actually planning to use it in. So um, it's interesting to see kind of the overlapping of the process of planning that we both use, even though we're in completely different spaces, um, kind of doing different things, but all with the same right. goal. Um, so you've made sure that what you're looking to do makes sense in this space. Um, what do you do to move forward for the next step with your team? Yeah, so moving forward, um, 
there's a lot of fabrication and construction that has to happen in both uh, before we're able to install and sort of during install. Um, so for example, for this show, we were able to uh, sort of prefabricate a lot of our walls um, well before we were able to install everything. And that uh, really helped make the installation process a lot easier. Uh, so here on the right, you see uh, Eric Montefusco from our talented facilities team installing some walls, but uh, those were pre-cut months in advance and painted by uh, some really dedicated and talented volunteers months in advance with layers and layers of primer and paint and sealant. Um, so there's a lot of both front-end fabrication as well as in-place installation and construction that we do both in-house as well as working with uh, contractors and external fabricators. Uh, there's certain things that we can't really do beforehand, like on the left side here, you see uh, Angelada and Phil uh, Ganoski um, building this pond here. And of course, we we had an exhibition there, so we, we only had two weeks to tear out and install that bed there. And we, there's no way to do it other than to dig it out. So really, there's a there's lots of either things we can do beforehand or things that are constrained to on-site, on-time, right on-demand construction. But uh, there's a lot of construction that goes into it. So thankfully we have a talented team in the horticulture team and in the facilities team that really comes together and is able to get it done. Yeah, as well as many, many volunteers. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and great volunteers at that, that you know, have skill and dedication that can see the projects through. Yeah. So we have a few questions from our viewers. Our first one is from Pamela. Um, they're a local 3D artist, and they're actually really interested in acquiring some of the sets from the exhibition. Um, I'm not sure what's available or what's possible, but um, can you talk a little bit about what happens at the close of the exhibition? Absolutely. That's a great question. Yeah, um, you know, of course, we we make all these uh, sort of pieces of art, if you will, or props uh, at the beginning of the show. And then, of course, a lot of it we're not going to have use for at the end of the show. And we we try to throw away as little as possible and generate as little waste as possible. So we do uh, certain things we will sell to staff or we will sell to our members at our Members Day sale or earlier on. So we'll, we'll probably send out something at some point with a list of items for sale. But if, if they want to reach out to me with a specific inquiry, um, then I'd be happy to uh, get back with them and let if that particular piece is going to be available or pieces. Awesome. Um, Mary said the image of um, the plants reminds her that the pots you use throughout the conservatory and the outdoor exhibit were gorgeous. Do we borrow them, buy them, or do we have a huge storeroom of pots? Uh, that's a, another great question. Uh, so for this exhibition, we purchased a lot of pots. You actually can see um, about four shopping carts full of containers that are actually ones we use for the show. Um, additionally, we do sort of have a stock of pots that we hold on to and certainly a lot of these will, we will probably hold on to. Um, and then relating that back to the previous question, we do occasionally um, sell our pots to our members during the Members Day plant sale. So I can't imagine we'll keep all of the, oh, I don't know, 100 or a few hundred pots that we bought for this show. So uh, if you're a member and you want to come to our Members Day sale, it's very likely that some of these will be available then. Um, so we were on the construction portion, um, similar to what you were talking about when you were explaining ground truth is we also experience challenges in the museum and we have to kind of pivot our ideas to make them work. Can you talk a lot, a little bit about the experience with challenges you had out in the gardens? Right. Yeah. And of, of course you can't ground truth everything to scale in sight. 
especially when you have uh, an exhibition up in your museum or you have an exhibition up in the gardens. Um, and you know, a lot of times we're doing things that we've never done before or has never been done before necessarily. Uh, so we do run into hiccups that we have to adapt uh, and modify our plans to overcome. Uh, one really funny one that happened with this show is, if you've seen the show, we, we have a record player outside that's made to look like it's playing a Patti Smith album. And we thought, great, we'll, we'll put this record player out, we'll try to waterproof it as best we can, run power to it, and we'll put a record on it. And that's that. But uh, we did not account for the fact that PVC records and ultraviolet radiation and high temperatures are, are not a great mix. So we we ended up after a few days with a warped record and you know it, it looked kind of cool but it didn't uh, spin very well and the, the, the track didn't stay on so the record player would turn off. So we had to adjust and in that particular case the solution we came up with, with, with was to take a picture of the actual record we wanted to have with the label and everything and then have a vendor do a vinyl wrap of that picture to the platter of the record player. And uh, that ended up not working. Um, another challenge that I'm very thankful, and I, I know our greenhouse team is very thankful that we uh, saw and were able to nip before it became a problem was uh, in the conservatory, we have a few spots where there's hundreds of aeroids hanging, you know, 10 feet. Uh, overhead, um, this particular spot, these Monstera adansonii are suspended above a pond. So really, uh, we realized that, you know, it's going to be difficult to water hundreds of six inch pots for six months and keep everything alive and keep our staff sane. Uh, so we decided uh, as we were doing it, well, we need to find an easier way to do this and we installed a one drip emitter, emitter for each plant so that these could be more automatically watered. Um, and it's really was probably better for the plants as well as better for our staff. And I actually, it looks really cool if you're in there when the water's running, because it's like, it's raining in the exhibition. It's like a little water feature in and of itself. So well, we're all very happy we, we did that. Um, but once we have everything in and we uh, dot all our I's and cross all our T's, it's, it's really nice to look back at our work and uh, it's very gratifying for myself and the rest of the team to see everything installed and then see people's reactions um, as they come through. So here are just a, here's a couple of shots of some zoomed in pieces of some of the vignettes of the gardens. Yeah, we always here in the museum hear great feedback and comments about everything your team's done out in the conservatory and in the gardens. Um, before we move on, we have about 35 minutes left to focus on the different vignettes, um, but we have one question from Linda asking if you can repeat the name of your favorite plant and explain where it is in the exhibition. Absolutely. Um, it'll come up later, so I'll be sure to mention it then. Um, yeah, actually, I'll just, I'll wait till it comes up later, and then if you can remind me, if I don't remember, I'll mention it then, because then we'll have a picture in the context. Okay. They sounds, can be patient. Sounds good. Um, so let's get started with the garden vignettes that visitors will encounter. Right, so uh, before we get into it, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the challenges of the gardens in particular, as opposed to the uh, greenhouse conservatory, tropical conservatory. Uh, for this show, of course, to represent Robert Maplethorpe and Patti Smith, we wanted to have beds with a lot of color for Patti Smith, and we wanted to have uh, beds with more sort of grayscale plant foliage for Robert Maplethorpe. Um, and this is, you know, not limited to just this show, but all of our shows. Um, it is not necessarily the easiest thing to keep things alive and happy or colorful and blooming for a six month show that starts in the nice, cool, uh, beautiful winter months in February and ends in the heat of June, which we are at right now. 
Um, there's a lot of you know different conditions from the temperature changes to the sun exposure as the sun moves from the south to the north, as well as changes in rainfall and humidity. Um, so we have to choose plants or plan to replace plants as uh, site conditions change. So, you know, we might start out with a, a nice, cool, shady spot, and then in two or three months, we're getting high temperatures and direct sun for eight hours of the day. And some plants can adapt and adjust to those conditions, but there are uh, things that come up and we need to plan or adapt to swap things in and out. And uh, we also need to consider for all the things we fabricate, well, this is outside where palm fronds are gonna be falling, winds are gonna be blowing, tropical storms you know, might be rolling through, high winds. So we need to design things that can hold up to the wind of being right on the bay and hold up to the torrential rains we might get, which make the plants very happy in the spring, but uh, the plywood not as much or the record players not as much. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, once we're able to overcome those challenges, which are what make us a living museum, then we, <laughs> you know, we have our vignettes. So this is the first uh, vignette that visitors will encounter, is that correct? Yeah, so this is actually, it's kind of fun. This is really a, an early inspiration for the first vignette that we'll see in the next couple slides, which we've titled Tree in Frame. Uh, before we came up with that idea, this was one that sort of inspired it, but was one that got the chopping block because we, you know, had other ideas and the layout and flow of them made more sense to omit this one. But uh, in the children's rainforest garden, uh, there's this amazing pandanus spiralis on display. And that really inspired me as a phenomenal specimen that I thought Maplethorpe would appreciate if he came in the garden. So I thought it'd be grand to do a frame in front of it with a black, a white backdrop behind it. And then from that idea, where I, I did on the right, took this photo and photoshopped it, and we decided it'd be nice to have a series after conversations with myself and Christopher Ellenstar, the director of the gardens. Uh, so we decided we would do three and it would be great. But, you know, as we, went along and we're chopping ideas, we decided it would make more sense in this context and have just as grand an appeal, if not a grander one. So as you come to the Welcome Center for the Gardens, this is the first of vignette you'll be greeted with. You can see on the left here, this one, I think this was the first sketch of this and it really did sort of encapsulate the idea and it didn't adjust too much other than details and sort of how but the what remain the same. So you see here, there's some notes, tab bed framed and a 12 by 12 frame on the Northeast side of the bed, a white mesh backdrop behind, white rock below. From there, I took a picture of the site and uh, sort of photoshopped some things that would approximate the idea and the point across. And uh, we, everybody was liking this one, so, we did a 3D model of it. Uh, that was, I think that was the model that was used in the presentation to your team and to Jennifer Amanecki and Wendy Deming, CEO and COO. And then here we have uh, the director of the gardens uh, as a whole, Mike McLaughlin, uh, holding a tape measure so that we can actually see what a 12 by 12 frame would look like uh, next to our tree. Uh, so this is part of the ground truthing process. And uh, it's good that we did this because, you know, if we did it based on the sort of back of the napkin calculations, we probably would have hit this awning here and it would have been too tall. And um, another thing we ran into is so these pavers have a sort of concrete footer holding them in place. So we had to shrink everything in six inches or so. Or so. Otherwise, we uh, would have hit concrete when we tried to bury our posts. And what kind of tree is that that you used? All right, this is a Tadabuya aria. So it's a tree that's native to the uh, tropical America and the Caribbean. Um, it's also called uh, golden trumpet tree because it has these gorgeous golden 
tubular flowers. And uh, here's what it ended up looking like. Uh, really, you know, we were very happy with how this turned out and it wasn't too much different in concept than the original idea. Uh, one detail though that we sort of came up with as we were going through it is to put this pot in here. Um, and that really encapsulated, okay, this is a, a maple thorpe cut flower in a vase and a bud vase, which is what uh, we were going for. So there's lots of details like that that we'll sort of come up with further along in the design and installation process. And that's part of why it's not so linear as that chart that we looked at at the very beginning. Yeah, exactly. Um, from here, another aspect of the Welcome Center is this sort of um, juxtaposed planting that leads up to this black and white framed living wall. And uh, you can see the original sketch here was a living wall of solid gray tillandsias with a black frame coming out along a shelf for a potted six inch plant and a front bed with lush green tropical foliage except in front of the living wall where it's grayscale or stark. And uh, so the, we changed a little bit in that the original intent was sort of just to lush it out with tropical foliage. But as we got further along in the design process, we realized we should have color there to really um, represent Patty Smith in this bed and show the two of them together. And that came up in this rendering, which was a helpful rendering for us to decide how many plants we would need, as well as how much mulch, how much shell, how much ground cloth and other materials we might need. And again, this one, while the execution and some of the details uh, changed and evolved, like the exact design of the frame, which our volunteers built, the overall concept from this one really didn't change too much from that original design. So from there, we'll go inside the gardens. And this is the first thing that you'll see as you exit the conservatory and start to walk south around the loop of the gardens. And this one's sort of fun because you really see these two irrelevant sketches that are kind of the seed uh, and morphed and combined to be the final product of this bed. So on the left here, I think somebody had the idea of just having a viewfinder that sort of framed out a plant. I think the idea was to sort of do part of the glass was frosted and part of it was clear so that there's sort of a blurring of foreground and background, but the specimen is in focus. And it's sort of the uh, rectangle of a camera viewfinder. Then on the right here, we just sort of have the idea to have these nice white pedestals with uh, architectural maple thorpian plants in great uh, maple thorpe containers with a black backdrop. And both of those ideas sort of morph together in the site of the koi pond. Um, and then combined with a different idea of a camera viewfinder to make this, which got the idea of the foreground background from the one idea and got the sort of layout from the other sketch. And we ended up with this, which was this giant frame of a, a viewfinder, which is being wheeled in this picture by our facilities team member, Chris Woodier, and uh, supported by Mike McLaughlin and ended up being cantilevered over and um, appearing to flow over the koi pond and allowing for a really nice backdrop to these gorgeous specimens which we have potted up and floating in the koi pond. One question I've had over the last couple months is how are those plants watered and taken care of and changed out? How are they accessed? Right. Um, well, in this particular context, we have some waiters and we, <laughs> we just get in, or, although I have been known and other team members have been known to just wear shorts and forego the waiters and get a little, get a little dirty. Uh, fortunately, the koi don't bite, so it's, it's easy enough to get in there and get out. And while it does look very deep in there, it's actually only, you know, between probably three, three and a half feet deep in most of the koi pond. Oh, interesting. Mm 
we do sometimes though have tools to, uh, you know, like if we need to prune something off, we have extension pruners, or if we need to grab something, we have, you know, grabbers on a stick that we can groom things with, but nothing beats getting in there and watering if we need to, or scrubbing off the pedestals, grooming the plants, cleaning leaves out of the pots. So it's a, it's a fun job. It changes <laughs> up and makes it dynamic for our horticulturists. Yeah, definitely. From there, as you walk around, you'll see one of the vignettes, which I think was probably one of the first we got to do this ideas that we had. Uh, so on the left here, I think we have a sketch from Mike McLaughlin, which is for our self-portrait vignette. Uh, so sort of a, you become part of a Maplethorpe photo, uh, photo opportunity. Um, so you'll see here, Mike did that sketch and then I, I think from there, I just went right in and rendered it. And I think this was probably the first thing for this show that I did in SketchUp as a 3D model because it was straightforward. And uh, I think we knew we wanted to do it. And the product that we came out with was, I think, really nice. I hear we have the head of marketing at Selby, Greg Lubarecki. And uh, he's a perfect photo model for this. <laughs> in uh, he's exercising his black and white hashtag that we've had for this show for Maplethorpe photography. From there, moving along, we, uh, we had a really strong Patty Smith vignette, which was a, a highly collaborative one and involved a lot of input from different departments. Uh, so in this vignette, we sort of try to recreate the feel of uh, being outside of, on a stoop at the Chelsea Hotel, which is where Robert and Patty lived together earlier on in their relationship and career. And uh, the kicker on this one is that uh, Just Kids, the memoir that Patty Smith wrote about their relationship is being played in its entirety at a really nice volume behind these benches that you can sit on. And that was a great lesson for us because one, uh, the gardens team had not done any audio in the past. So we had to figure out impedance and wiring and you know running speakers in series or parallel, as well as we had to work with uh, Mandy Arthur and uh, your team to figure out you know rights for being able to play uh, music or audio in the public gardens, um, as well as, you know, what sort of licensing do we need? What sort of file formats are we allowed to use? And um, this, your team really helped, yeah, you and David, to flesh this one out. And uh, I think it was your team that had the idea to just play the book in its entirety. You know, as we were thinking about what excerpts to use, we decided, well, really, no, it makes sense to have a lot of it going because you're <laughs> evolving experience as you come through the gardens. Yeah, definitely here, you know, one of the things that you mentioned in the beginning was that balance of highlighting both artists and their work. So using her full book just kind of made sense. And um, we definitely, I think being new in our position, learned the importance of, you know, thinking early on about what's needed to make each vignette and concept complete. And so um, super grateful to Mandy Arthur um, and our finance and tech team uh, for her help and confirming what we needed to do to make this work for us. Right. And uh, it's a really pleasant place to sit and listen. I mean, I think everybody was happy with this one. Uh, this one's fun. You can, this is a, a great vignette. You see sort of one sketch that maybe kind of inspired the more finalized idea on the left here, which was just this sort of corridor of frames to get the idea of a photo gallery. Uh, but then as we thought about, you know, placing this idea in sight, we chose a location and then I came up with this layout, which we colloquially called the chicken footbed for a long time as we were talking about it as shorthand and fabricating it. Uh, we sort of thought it looked like a chicken foot, but gallery exposed was a, a much better concept. So you see the sketch, you see the SketchUp model, which we used to talk about it. 
here's earlier on some uh, layout happening. So we're sort of measuring the site and figuring out where the walls would go and how we build them. You can see, I think that's either Mike McLaughlin or Christopher Ellenstar there helping me lay that out. And you have some uh, lovely flamingos. So this must have been during uh, December or maybe late November uh, while Lights and Bloom was up. Then on the right side here, you see the posts went in the ground. Um, probably something like 20 or 30 posts right there to hold up all the holes. Uh, so we really got our work out that day, as well as you can actually see some trenching because we had to run irrigation to all the plants that we installed, as well as um, we needed electricity for the lighting that was going to be up after hours. So here it is coming along. You see the, the plywood going up. It's been painted already. This was all you know, pre-cut and painted beforehand, and we just had to know uh, where each panel would go. And then you see Christopher Ellenstar here testing out our backdrops as we had them fabricated. And the ground cloth starts to go in so that we don't get shell in the ground. And then here's it with all the final pieces. That's one of my favorite vignettes. <laughs> yeah, me too. This one I think is, is probably my favorite. Um, but this one I think is a pretty interesting one as well. So here's an early idea of just sort of having plants on display floating in a sort of black void. And we sort of took that and then took the idea of a camera aperture and ended up putting that in a site where we had to you know, essentially make a black box so that these plants would disappear into nothing. And then we added in some spotlights so that they popped in and were really just sort of floating in space. And this one is, it's really fun to see the, you know, how the rendering looked from the beginning and then how it ended up in the end. Moving along, another uh, sort of crowd favorite, I think we call this one Wave of Grey uh, because of the album Wave by Patti Smith is playing and most of the planting is grayscale for Robert Mapplethorpe. So you see, we wanted to essentially make a garden so it feels like you're just transformed into a totally black and white environment where the center bed has color as if the record player in the middle is shooting out color to represent Patti Smith. And then also the whole shape of the bed is kind of like an album where you know you have a colorful label surrounded by a gray or black uh, album. Uh, this one turned out you know, quite similar to the sketch. And you see, I think we put in uh, 30, 45 gallon buttonwood plants for this one. And beforehand there was a pond here. So there was a lot of labor that went in. <laughs> Really you know, thankful for the volunteers that helped plant all these. We have a question um, from Mary. She said she's visited the exhibition several times um, and she was wondering about the, the actual plants. Did mm -hmm. we have, um, did you purchase multiple plants of the same type to switch out throughout the exhibition or were things swapped out different plants throughout the exhibition? Right. So, yeah, you know, we sort of try to over order a little bit so that if things fade out, we have backups. Um, but of course, that's not feasible to do for everything. Um, so there, you know, it's sort of a bit of put it in the ground or, you know, put it in place and um, try to just keep it healthy and know if we're, how we have a contingency plan for if it fails. Uh, however, for, you know, a lot of the sort of orchids that we had and plants and planters or little pots uh, in our frames and stuff, those we knew we were going to switch out. So we had uh, orders coming in monthly for certain plants, or we just had sort of a stock uh, in the nursery where we could sort of keep things looking healthy, healthy and nurse them to, you know, prime perfection. And then as things go in and out of bloom or are looking better or worse, we can switch them in and out. So that's a great question. Did you let any of them grow naturally and 
like continue to grow in their pots or were they switched out um, to maintain like a certain size and look for those specific pots or potted plants? Right, uh, so that's a great question. One of the things that we need to know as horticulturists for these shows is, you know, how fast growing are these plants and how sort of, or how slow growing are they? And some plants, you know, are really quite static and they won't move a lot and they'll be quite similar to the first day whereas other plants either grow fast and they'll be too big and need to be pruned or they'll go out of bloom and need to be switched out with something that's in bloom. Uh, so yeah, some things uh, stayed in and for example, the Monstera uh, deliciosa, which is the sort of focal point of the chicken foot bed or gallery exposed, I think that one stayed in the entire show. Um, and you know, it did shoot out some new leaves and sort of change a little bit, but ultimately remain. So a great question. And then the last uh, vignette in the gardens is also the first thing you see as you enter the Museum of Buying and the Arts. And we call it contrast and balance. So we've got this beautiful color bed on the left with a microphone to represent Patty Smith, very grayscale bed on the right with a camera to represent Maplethorpe. And then we've got these frames um, that have Maplethorpe and plantings in them and an overhead pergola, which gives a sort of Venetian blind Maplethorpe shadow. So there's a lot going on in this vignette. Um, and this one was really interesting to make because we did want to collaborate with what was going on in that room. So we wanted to have uh, materials that would let the light through to allow natural light in that room. And these shadows you can see on the back side of that mesh. And um, yeah, this was, a, this was a great one to do. Um, with this being right where I work at the Museum of Botany and the Arts, I'm pretty familiar um, with this specific vignette. Can you share the detail about the window coverings? I think it's pretty, pretty yes. interesting. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, uh, it's one of my favorite details of this one is that the gray cloth, uh, which really, you know, of course, it works well for Maplethorpe being a nice sort of textured gray background is actually the cloth that would be on a Fender style amplifier, which uh, Patty or her band might have used uh, back in the day or to this day. Yeah, that's really great. I think, you know, with this being the first artist who um, was a musician or is a musician that we featured in the garden, I think like adding those um, small music related details is really cool. That's one of my yeah. favorites. Um, yeah, I, I'm a I'm a bit of a music gear nerd, so that one was <laughs> that one was one that I was like, yes, let's do this. So we have about ten minutes left to talk about the tropical conservatory, so let's get started with that. All right. So yeah, the tropical conservatory is a uh, very similar in a lot of ways to the displays we do in the gardens, but a little bit different in that one we have a shorter window to install. Really, for this show, it was a little over two weeks, and for some shows, it's been as little as one and a half week to remove everything that's in there and you know start from scratch and put everything in. Uh, and then some other considerations for the site is it's a lot different growing in a garden uh, than growing in a greenhouse. So the, the plant material uh, that we use you know has to be able to deal with higher humidity, more shade, uh, differences in temperature and other factors as well. Uh, so the first thing you see as you come in, uh, you see our gray walls, which uh, we had to ground truth to achieve our nice gradient and sight. And those are looking at a nice uh, cover of the Horses album, Patty's seminal album that was shot by Robert Maplethorpe and Sam Wagstaff, Robert's uh, benefactor and boyfriend at one point's apartment. And then behind her, uh, you can see our a uh, blue tassel fern that we got for this show, Phlegmarius, Phlegmariaris dalhousianus. Um, but if you look at blue tassel fern, that'll pull up a plant that looks similar to this as well as this plant. And that um, was what you mentioned as your favorite plant for the show? That's right, that's my, that's my favorite plant for this show. Awesome. It's, a, yeah. it's a special plant, it's very unique. 
um, this vignette was a little bit of a challenge just securing the rights for that image. We really knew we wanted to incorporate that album cover because as you said, it was taken by Maplethorpe. Um, so uh, we worked our magic and are really happy that we were able to, to secure the rights to use it. Yeah, thank you for getting all the rights for everything for the show. This one really turned out great. It's nice to see Patty as you walk in in that iconic pose. Um, and then the other idea we wanted to convey in the conservatory was that of a photo studio. So we initially saw some photos of Robert Mapplethorpe in his studio and we drew inspiration from that to have a photo studio, but with a pond and as previously mentioned overhead Monstera. So on the left here is a sort of bird's eye view that Mike McLaughlin sketched up. And then from that, I created a 3D model in SketchUp and a few steps later, um, a little bit of uh, digging, and ended up with uh, what you see here. Then uh, you can actually see another element in the conservatory from this shot, which is this cascade of uh, black frames floating in front of a white backdrop, sort of an abstraction of a photo gallery, if you will, uh, with epiphytes because we are, of course, an epiphyte-centric garden. So this one, I think I just went straight to the SketchUp. I don't think I did any hand sketches because I wanted to see it in sight, and it was kind of simple enough to do rectangles and plants. And it ended up looking pretty similar to uh, the sketch. Of course, more stunning, <laughs> especially I with those happy epetulums. I love seeing the um, different vignettes, your original ideas and sketchups and how some of them translate almost directly like this one. Um, and some are have a little bit of variation. So it's really neat for us all to see what that process looks like and how things come to a final product. Right, yeah, and it, we love that too. Uh, but we also love that, you know, as we're installing things and as we're going through, you know, our staff can come up with these little ideas and finishing touches that will add different depth or you know really be a cherry on top mm -hmm. to certain things. Exactly. Uh, so what we're looking at now is actually I think one of the first sketches of this idea that turned into the next vignette which was to have this cascading uh, you know frames uh, changing in from one shade of gray to another shade of gray. So we started thinking about it from one view and then in place we sort of rotated it and decided it would be more interesting and more gallery-like if uh, there was a series of these holes, staggered, you know, positions, shape, size, and angle, rotation, all that. And this one I think turned out really nice. Uh, it's hard to capture from one photo because it was designed so that you sort of move around and interact with it. But uh, it, looked, it turned out really nicely. Definitely one worth visiting in this last week if you haven't seen it yet while well, the show is still up. Uh, then moving on in the conservatory, we have a more Patty-centric vignette. So we were inspired, of course, by the their relationship and context of where they were in New York. Um, and of course, the iconic Chelsea Hotel, which is not only iconic because they were there, but because uh, a lot of creatives, philosophers, musicians, uh, visual artists, et cetera, moved through the Chelsea Hotel throughout the years. So we set this up to be like their uh, studio across the street, looking at their apartment. Uh, so you got a window with a shot of the Chelsea Hotel. You have uh, an excerpt from her poem, Flowers. Uh, which is, or sorry, her poem, A Final Flower, which is in the forward to a flowers book. That's a collection of color uh, shots of Robert Mapplethorpe doing flowers. And then, of course, we have a nice park bench for you to sit and read the text and a lot of colorful begonias and orchids and the other foliage, uh, bromeliads and such that really, you know, feel out of place, but really nice in the context of a studio. 
I really like this vignette because in the museum, we've also used some excerpts from A Final Flower. Um, so I think it speaks to kind of like our bigger goal of making the outdoor space connect and be cohesive with the indoor space portion of the exhibition. Um, so I really like the connection that we've made working together here. Yeah, it's been, it's been really nice to see how the different, uh, the Living Museum and the Literal Museum have so many parallels, both in execution, uh, but also in this sort of process, as different as they are otherwise. Right. Speaking of sort of, you know, details and cherry on top, as we were doing installing this bed, we realized, you know, it might be nice to have one final feature. So I brought in a guitar and amp <laughs> to sacrifice to the cause. And I think it, it ended up being really nice in the bed, especially the way the the lacquered body of the guitar reflects the foliage and flowers around it. I also brought in a microphone and some guitar picks. So it really feels like maybe Patty is sitting around, you know, <laughs> messing on her guitar. So the penultimate vignette in the conservatory is sort of a parallel but different vignette to the gallery exposed or chicken foot as we colloquially called it throughout the process in the gardens. So we wanted to have a photo gallery with living photos um, and make it feel like a sort of, you know, museum white wall, but uh, of course, totally flank it and tropical foliage. Uh, so that's what we did. So we ended up hanging, you know, it's like a couple hundred uh, Rapidophora tetrasperma overhead and below as well. And then uh, this was a great place for us to rotate specimens in and out as they bloomed or had nice uh, cut foliage or cut flowers or just had nice form. So some of these plants pictured, I think actually stayed throughout most of the show. We might have moved position or container, but uh, a lot of them, uh, as was asked earlier, a lot of these did rotate in and out as they came in and out of the room. Uh, this is a picture from earlier on, right as the show is opening, and this is from a bit later, so you see there's different specimens in there. Um, the foliage has grown and changed. Uh, there's more lighting in this shot, and there's a specimen that was put in. Uh, and then finally, uh, one of my other favorite vignettes is this sort of, you know, I've been calling like binary lithograph. I don't know that that's a great way to describe it, but it's this optical illusion that creates an image of one of the shots that we actually have on display in the Museum of Botany and the Arts in your gallery. And this is another example of the cohesiveness we were looking for throughout the planning process. Um, this was made by Benchtop, who we contract with as the preparators for our exhibition. So it's really nice to know that that same level of expertise and attention to detail is cohesive throughout um, with important pieces like this. So thank you to Benchtop for their work and partnership for our major spring exhibitions um, in both spaces and also always for exhibitions here in the Museum of Botany and the Arts. That's right, yeah, it's been great to collaborate with all our talented contractors and with your department as well. Yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us today. This concludes our present presentation. Um, a special thank you to all our volunteers and staff who collaborate on this big project throughout the year. Um, and thank you to all of our visitors and members who joined us today um, and being engaged throughout asking questions um, and entering your thoughts into the chat. We really appreciate your positive comments. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, please, if you haven't seen it or if you need to get one more uh, visit in before it's down, please come see the show before it closes uh, this Sunday, June 26th. Uh, and with that, we're going to play a video montage of the vignettes to play us out. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Kelsey.
Bye, everyone. Right, thanks, everybody. Have a great day.